So I still see the participants ticking up. So we're just going to wait a few more minutes. All right, it's 11.03. I think it's time to get started. Um, before I start with the session, it is customary at the University of Toronto to provide the following land acknowledgement. Although this event is taking place virtually, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful, grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. With that, I would like to welcome everybody to today's event uh, from the Crypto Economics and Blockchain Research Forum, um, also co-organized here at the Rotman School of Management uh, from the FinHub, which is the University of Toronto's uh, Financial Innovation Lab. I'm Andreas Park, and I'm your host for today. Um, I also would like to quickly acknowledge the sponsors of my research center, which is uh, TD Bank, the Global Risk Institute, and the Rotman Catalyst Fund. And I also want to thank the organizers and the organizing team in the background for helping us with this. Um, I have to start out with some bad news in the following sense. We are supposed to have a symposium of three speakers. Unfortunately, one of the speakers, Daniel Sanchez, will not be able to attend today because he has to handle a uh, COVID-related fam family emergency, with which him and his family all the very best. But unfortunately, he cannot make it, and his co-author has a prior engagement, so he can't do it either. And for that reason, we're going to have only two presentations today. Now, before I come to this specific event, I was also asked um, by my colleague, uh, dear colleague Liang Yang, to make a quick announcement that he is organizing a conference um, on markets and uh, economies, economies with information frictions, uh, that, which is um, part of a um, special issue with the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control. And the deadline for that is, I believe, today. So if this is something that is of interest to you, go submit your paper there and attend this uh, very interesting conference. Now with that, um, just a quick intro to the event. Um, this is an event for the Crypto Economics and Blockchain Research Forum. Um, for those of you who are familiar with this, we hold monthly webinar series and also a monthly symposium. Sympo today we have a symposium, which is meant to be uh, several papers put together under a common theme. Um, our research group uh, is loosely connected across, of course, the entire world. Uh, and our focus is on crypto economics and blockchain, but for obvious reasons over the last uh, months, um, central bank digital currencies have crept into our agenda. We had several webinars already on this. We had a conference last month where we had conference presentations on this. And the presentations that we had so far focused on a large variety of topics. And central bank digital currencies uh, are something that will most likely change the way our economies work very fundamentally. It will touch everybody's life. And it's probably one of the biggest changes that we'll see worldwide in many countries over the next uh, decade or so. Now, the papers that we've seen in the past focused on topics such as financial stability, uh, international payments, and so on. And uh, I wanted to organize a, a particular session which focuses more on the payments dimension. Personally, I've been involved with the design of a um, design proposal for CBDC for the Bank of Canada. And uh, one of the topics that they emphasized very strongly was uh, that they would like to see an improvement or increase in competition and payments. So we have two speakers today, um, we're supposed to have three, and just to explain to you a little bit of the background, Angelika Welte, who is going to speak first, uh, has done some very interesting research on the current state of our payment system and on the competition of it, um, and I'll let her, of course, speak to it. And uh, Martin Schneider has written a paper which brings together the credit dimension and um, the, the interaction with the payment space. Daniel Sanchez and his co-author co have done something similar. Um, 
you know, using a similar methodology and approach, they reached uh, slightly different conclusions. And I wanted to have both of these papers presented so that uh, the audience gets informed and also us as researchers, we get informed about, you know, interesting questions in the space. Now I've talked enough about this. I would like to hand it over to Angelica Welte from the uh, Bank of Canada. I hope I get this right. Angelica, you are a senior economist there and you are in the payments department. And uh, I hand the floor over to you. Now, the way we're going to, um, to organize the session is we're going to have a presentation, which was going to be roughly about 20 minutes for Angelica. We then go straight over to Martin for another 20 minute presentation. And then we're going to have the Q&A. So I'd like everybody to hold off the questions and, and I will be moderating the Q&A after. Angelica, um, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Andreas, for the uh, introduction. Um, so I'll be uh, presenting uh, uh, our work on the uh, distributional effects of payment card pricing and uh, merchant cost pass through in uh, Canada and the US. Um, so uh, before I start, I, uh, I need to um, um, make the usual disclaimer. So the views expressed in this presentation and in the paper do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston the, or uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, the Federal Reserve System, um, or uh, the Bank of Canada. So um, with that in mind, so this is joint work um, between the Bank of Canada, um, so Marie-Hélène Feld and myself, and uh, um, Fumiko Hayashi from the uh, Kansas City Fed and Joanna Stavins from the um, um, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, so, and it is a you know honor to present that today. Uh, I'm really impressed by the great turnout. I count, counted uh, about 150 attendees. So, um, that's a very good turnout, I think. So, I'll um, with that in mind, I'll, I'll start presenting. So, uh, what was the motivation for this work? Um, so, in Canada and the US. Um, we know that merchants generally do not differentiate prices based on payment methods. So when uh, you go to a store and uh, you buy something, then uh, whether you pay with cash, debit or credit card, uh, you will pay the posted price that is uh, um, the little sticky on the shelf where you get the item from. Uh, because of that, merchants uh, pass through the cost of accepting payment methods to all consumers. Um, and no matter what uh, um, what method of payment the consumer chooses, um, because they pay the same price, so um, and therefore the pass through component from the um, from the payment cost is uh, the same for for all um, merchants. And this is the case, although uh, previous research has shown that uh, credit card payments are the most expensive um, for um, merchants. So therefore. Um, because credit card uh, transactions are the most expensive, uh, they're cross-subsidized by lower cost payment methods, such as uh, debit card payments and cash payments. Uh, and then, uh, so there are other sources of uh, cross-subsidies as well, um, because we know that uh, some credit card owners might uh, receive credit card rewards, um, which might uh, generate additional cross-subsidies. And then another source of cost for the consumer are the um, bank account fees and other usage fees that they pay to their financial institution. Um, so, and why, uh, what motivates us to look at uh, potential regressive effects is that uh, research has shown over and over again that higher income users have greater access to credit cards and also use them often more intensively. Um, so uh, these observations uh, might lead us to, um, to hypothesis that the cross subsidies uh, could generate regressive distributional effects, which means that uh, lower income consumers would proportionally bear a greater burden. So the method by which we approach that is that we leverage um, data sets that, uh, the, that we've collected at the Bank of Canada and that the uh, um, also the Federal Reserve um, Bank of Atlanta um, and other others of the Federal Reserve Banks have collected uh, to uh, quantify the net pecuniary cost of uh, using the three uh, main payment methods in Canada and the US, which are cash, credit cards, and debit cards. And uh, the data that we have that we have actually allows us to um, quantify this net pecuniary cost across different income cohorts. Um, 
because uh, we do have um, micro data on the uh, consumer level from which we uh, know uh, how um, the consumers in each income cohort choose their payment methods. So what do we include in the net costs? Um, first, uh, the pass-through merchant cost of accepting the payments. And then uh, second, um, all the fees that consumers pay to financial institutions, so that includes um, bank account fees, um, things like annual fees uh, for credit cards, and also um, fees that the consumer might pay uh, for making um, debit card transactions or uh, cash withdrawals that are not included in their um, in their monthly package. Um, one thing that I'd like to mention, we um, presently do not inclu include um, uh, interest charges on credit cards. So we only include the fees. We don't include interest in the, in the net cost. And then lastly, uh, we include uh, rewards for credit cards as a, as a negative cost, so a benefit. So we have uh, rewards here for uh, credit and debit cards. Um, in Canada, most of the rewards are for credit cards, but because um, our US co-authors uh, pointed out to us that the US uh, debit card rewards are, are more common, these are also included. And then uh, we um, asked the question whether low-income consumers incur uh, a greater net pecuniary cost relative to the transaction amount. So what are the key findings? The key findings is that, yes, uh, the um, highest income cohort uh, pays the least as a percentage of their transaction amount and uh, the lowest income pay the most. And from this, uh, we conclude that this may suggest these regressive distributional effects on consumers in, in both countries. And actually the three all the three costs that I uh, explained to you um, are channels for these distributional effects. So the merchant cost pass through, overall leads to higher retail price prices for all. And then uh, the bank account fees, especially um, in Canada, they are actually proportionally high. We find that they're proportionally high for low income consumers. And then um, lastly, card rewards benefit high income consumers. And um, the benefit from card rewards here is both um, from the fact that they have credit cards uh, more often that they also more likely to have rewards packages and when they have rewards packages they're also more likely to have these premium cards that pay higher rewards and uh, we conduct uh, a number of robustness checks uh, to um, look at the uh, different uh, assumptions of the model um, so in these robustness checks for example we um, um, vary the pass-through rate uh, so in the base case, the merchant passes through 90% of the um, of the cost to the um, to the consumer, but varying that uh, in between, let's say, uh, 75 and 100% uh, doesn't change the overall uh, um, results. So just uh, changes them quantitatively, but it doesn't change a pattern of uh, of the regressive distributional effects. Um, and another robustness check that we conduct is by looking at whether um, uh, what the effects are when uh, merchants serve only certain income cohorts, but still um, the uh, regressive distributional effects uh, um, remain. So I'll, I'll go now into showing you some of the quantitative results. Um, so our one of our main findings is that uh, merchant pass-through actually contributes most of the pecuniary costs. And this is a very interesting finding because of the three um, costs that we consider, the merchant pass-through is the cost that the consumer is not aware of, right? Because it is rolled into the, um, the price of the item that they buy. So you can see that here um, on my bar chart. So um, on the bar chart um, in red, I highlight the uh, cost uh, for the pass-through, and that is all in normalized to US dollars uh, per cohort. And you see that in every cohort, uh, the red bar is the highest, so it makes up most of the cost. And then the blue bar are the consumer fees uh, paid to financial institutions. And then the green bars, which go into the negative, those are the rewards that they receive. And you see that, um, as I said before, um, in, in absolute terms, so this is, these are absolute uh, dollar amounts received, you see that um, higher income consumers in both countries receive more rewards. Um, Overall, they also do in, 
incur uh, higher costs. Um, but please keep in mind that these are um, not uh, normalized by the amount spent yet. And then in gray, what I show here is uh, the induced merchant costs. So we calculate uh, from data on uh, merchant costs um, that we collected um, in, a, in a merchant survey. We collect, uh, we, we can compute uh, what the cost is for each of those payments that consumers make in these cohorts. And from that, we uh, can see how much it costs, each of these consumers costs the merchant sector. And that also increases with income. So um, next I'll show you uh, how the um, proportional costs play out. So um, on the left for Canada, you see that when we uh, look at the per dollar cost, we see this regressive effect. So um, per um, dollar spend, a consumer in the lowest income cohort in Canada, which is someone who lives in a household with a household income of less than $25,000, pays almost 1.8% in pecuniary cost um, for these payments. And that goes down to 1.21% for someone who lives in a household um, with an income of more than $135,000. And then the pattern on the right for the United States is, is similar. <clears throat> so um, one other thing that we um, investigate in the paper are ways to mitigate these distributional effects. So before I go into that, I just want to uh, raise a few caveats about our model. Um, so the way we uh, model this, we um, um, cannot really mo model um, how the consumer um, payment behavior would change if the costs were changed. So when we um, when we look at these ways of mitigating the effects, we'll always assume that um, the uh, the changes won't affect how they choose their payments. So we'll keep the same number of transactions and the same transaction amounts. For everyone. So one um, way to mitigate that would be to reduce credit card rewards along with interchange fees. And uh, we, um, because our model cannot really accommodate these uh, changes in payment behavior, we look at the modest de decrease in credit card rewards, and then uh, we reduce the interchange fee in such a way that the um, reduced cost of the rewards for the uh, issuing sector, so the bank, uh, is exactly offset by uh, the change in interchange fees. And uh, what we find is that uh, lower income consumers might benefit from that. Um, and that arises because, well, they experience a reduction in credit card rewards, but also the uh, pass through from the merchant through the interchange fee channel is lower. So overall their net pecuniary cost might go down. However, there are lots of caveats associated with that. So everyone who's uh, worked, um, there's any research on card payment system, I think you're probably all aware that this is a two-sided credit card payment system and that uh, there, um, when one uh, changes um, the cost of the fees of the rewards on one side, that there are lots of subsequent effects and externalities that need to be taken into account. So one thing that one might consider is that if, um, there's a change to the interchange fees that it might induce um, the issuing banks to change the provision of credit cards. And uh, actually one possible effect could be that they, was, that they could uh, stop issuing cards to low income consumers, in which case actually that would then not benefit them anymore. So one has to be very careful in interpreting these results. Um, I, um, because we don't take into account um, these externalities and subsequent effects. So this is a partial equilibrium model. This is not a full equilibrium in a two-sided market. So similarly, um, one could change a few structure associated with bank accounts um, and that would reduce regressive effects stemming from account fees. Um, again, um, we had to make some assumptions. So one assumption was that low cost accounts and typical bank accounts would have the same features. Um, that's not necessarily true. And then um, also um, banks might change the, um, how they uh, bundle services or uh, what type of accounts they provide in response to that. So again, uh, because this 
very partial equilibrium model, we uh, can't model all the effects and externalities. And lastly, um, as I pointed out to you, um, the merchant pass through is the largest component of the consumer's costs. And they're probably largely unaware of that. And they may be also largely unaware of the, especially the higher income cohorts, the costs that they impose on lower income consumers. So some people, if they become aware of that, they might change their payment behavior. Um, and that could then in the end lower merchant costs if they switch to uh, payment methods that are um, less expensive for the merchant and could reduce the cost pass through for all. But it is in our model, we haven't quantified that. Um, and again, also, um, of course, the uh, issuing side of that and also the uh, merchant acquiring side of that would respond to that. Um, in, and there might be um, subsequent effects that we can't capture in the model. So I just want to conclude with some remarks. Uh, so we use a simple model actually to quantify these net pecuniary effects and we can show with the model that uh, card payments induce these regressive effects and our findings are robust to uh, the um, assumptions of the model. Um, as I pointed out, consumers have very limited awareness that their individual payment preferences generate costs for all and that some of those costs actually come back to them in the form of merchant pass through, right? Um, so, but as we also learned from um, our discussion of these ways to mitigate um, um, distributional effects, um, changing prices or rewards or features on either side of this market um, can have unintended consequences and uh, need to be done uh, with great care and attention. Um, and lastly, I think um, this, so, Looking at COVID, COVID-19, this public health shock has like, at least for now, really shifted transactions to low contact sectors, such as online payments, where cash is not accepted. And also at the point of sale, there have been shifts from cash to cards. I think partially that's also explained to, by just larger ticket items, larger transaction amounts, because there might be fewer trips. And we know that uh, card payments are preferred for larger transaction amounts. And uh, that has really for now increased the significance of electronic payments and uh, brought up a lot of questions about um, adoption, um, acceptance and access to um, electronic payments. So right now, I think I have another paper uh, where I look at the um, cash card um, ratio during COVID. It's not clear yet whether these are permanent or transitory effects, but it is, uh, definitely something that uh, we are uh, monitoring and we're looking at that is very relevant for the Bank of Canada, not only um, um, for CBDC, but also because the Bank of Canada is the, the sole issuer of, of cash in Canada and uh, therefore looking at all the shifts in the, in the payment methods, particularly at the point of sale is very important for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica. Um, now, um, I already see some questions in the Q&A. Uh, I would like to encourage everybody to post more questions in the Q&A, but um, I would like to postpone the direct discussion of that until the end of the second presentation, which uh, is coming up now. Um, so um, the, the paper we're going to listen to next is, uh, is authored by Martin Schneider and uh, Monica Piasesi, I hope I got that name right. Um, and I should apologize maybe for the highly Germanic tilt today of today's presentation. This is entirely unintentional and endogenous to the papers. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Martin and uh, floor is yours. All right. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Andreas. Uh, thanks for putting together this session and then also for, for having us uh, uh, on the program, and uh, um, Monica uh, is half Italian, so uh, that, that brings international flavor. Um, okay, so this is a, a theoretical study of uh, central bank digital currency and related uh, innovations in uh, payments provision. And uh, there is a rapidly growing literature uh, on this that uh, looks at a bunch of different proposals. For the purposes of this talk, when I say CBDC, I'm going to mean interest-bearing reserves account for everyone. Okay. 
Um, and the new thing that we bring to the table in this discussion is that we understand the CBDC as a competitor in a market for liquidity, broadly speaking, uh, where this market for liquidity uh, includes not only bank deposits, there's been a lot of discussion of competition between CBDC and deposits, but also uh, credit lines. And this creates sort of a nice connection to, the, to Angelica's paper, uh, which, which uh, pointed out how uh, credit cards are an important uh, means of payment uh, for households. When I say credit lines, I want to think uh, even more broadly also uh, about credit lines to firms, uh, as well as uh, all the way to, um, say, custodian banks providing intraday credit to their um, to asset managers where, where they have um, the, 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 so the asset managers have their funds at this at these custodian banks, and so. Um, this space, uh, this market for liquidity is currently dominated by commercial banks. And that means that the same intermediary offers both bank deposits and credit lines. Uh, and uh, this exploits a complementarity. Um, if uh, whenever you draw down a credit line, then that becomes a deposit account in the banking system. This means that uh, balance sheets can be shorter than if this was done by separate intermediaries. And this lowers operating costs if the length of the balance sheet is costly. That's the, the key intuition in, in our uh, model. And then the, uh, the uh, implication of that is that CBDC is not complementary to credit lines. Uh, at least we don't have a proposal yet where, uh, where governments also provide uh, a credit card. Um, and that means that then CBDC is beneficial only if it is a lot cheaper to produce uh, than deposits. Yeah. Um, the, the basic mechanism, as we'll see, is going to rely on an externality among liquidity providers, and therefore it uh, applies not only to CBDC, but also to stable coins and to money market funds, which are other kind of deposit only providers of liquidity. Okay, so uh, let me uh, briefly relate to, to the literature. So um, in the theoretical literature, there's been the first uh, round of uh, comment has been, well, uh, we can provide conditions under which uh, this doesn't really matter that we have CBDC, roughly because uh, uh, the, um, say, uh, people now uh, bank with the central bank, then uh, the, the banks uh, can get funding uh, by getting loans from the central bank. And then this does, this sort of just offsets it in allocations, the real effects are the same. Um, these types of results are not going to hold in our framework because in our framework, the length of balance sheets at intermediaries is costly. Okay? And so we want to have a good payment system in our world is one in which the balance sheets and the asset management that has to be done is, is relatively short because uh, it all is costly. Um, uh, there, there are a couple of other effects that, that have received attention. There is uh, the interesting paper of uh, Daniel and uh, Todd Keister, which they unfortunately can present here, which uh, has this effect that uh, if, you, if um, deposits are important for banks to fund investment projects, then uh, competition from CBDC can kind of constrain lending. Um, that is something that we're going to not have in, in our setting, because our um, model will be one where banks basically just provide liquidity. And they do that in these two ways, with credit lines uh, or with um, deposits. But uh, uh, this, this kind of money supply is not important to fund investment. Uh, so we're going to explicitly not have that. Also, an important uh, consideration is, the, is market power, which we're also uh, going to have to be completely absent. Um, we're going to just focus on the new thing, which is this interaction between credit lines and deposits. And here we draw on the corporate finance literature, which has uh, argued that uh, credit lines can be part of optimal liquidity provision and has uh, provided evidence of this complementarity of deposits and loans at the individual bank level. Then here is going to be about how does this work in general equilibrium when there is this different, uh, there's competition between payment instruments. All right, so I'm going to sketch uh, the model. This is basically a neoclassical growth model with uh, the uh, with a twist, which is there's unpredictable liquidity needs. And then uh, those need to be met by uh, getting payment instruments. So we have uh, standard preferences and technology. There's households that work and consume goods. And we're going to have uh, complete financial markets that uh, lead to a representative household. So this is quite tractable. Um, and uh, there are going to be competitive firms that make goods from capital labor and also make capital from goods. 
And then um, the, the role for uh, money or payment instruments more generally comes because of liquidity constraints. And uh, there, there are two flavors of those. One is that um, buyers of goods, and this is in our model, households and producers of capital are gonna need payment instruments before they buy. So, they, so the, the idea is, well, they're sort of going in the decentralized market and they, um, they need to go shopping and there need to be flexibility. Okay? So this is gonna come through this constraint. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so they, have to, they, they need to arrange for the payment instruments to be there. And then uh, here, the key thing is that the uh, liquidity needs are unpredictable. So only some share V of the uh, households or capital producers gets a chance to buy. Okay, so it's, uh, there's, there's, um, there's risk there. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the sellers uh, that are the uh, producers of goods in our model, they're gonna need payment instruments after selling. Uh, here, the, the liquidity needs are predictable. These guys just have to store the funds in order to pay the wages and the rents later. Okay, and then the, the banks are uh, in the baseline model going to be the providers of the payment instruments and uh, they themselves uh, are going to have to have some payment instruments to meet customer outflows. Okay, um, let, let me talk more about how these, uh, these payment instruments work. So the competitive banks going to offer two such instruments. Uh, deposits are uh, payment instruments that you hold before trade then you spend them if you need to, if you get your liquidity charge, um, and you keep them otherwise. In contrast, a credit line is, is also arranged uh, before the, the, you go to shopping, uh, and then it is drawn down uh, to receive a loan if needed, but you don't use it otherwise. Okay. Um, and then you can see that uh, uh, what is the advantage of a credit line? Well, it basically avoids holding deposits that you may not need. And then why doesn't everybody have credit lines? Well, it might be too expensive. So that's kind of the way the trade-off works in the model. Um, now, um, what there are gonna be financial frictions in banks and firms so that there are uh, determinate uh, solutions to, uh, to their uh, balance sheet. Um, we're going to assume that there's a collateral constraint. So any debt uh, is less than three times the value of assets, fee some, some scalar. And then uh, the main uh, friction that's going to drive a lot of the results is this uh, asset management costs. And so we're going to make, make that technically very simple. We're going to say there's asset management services, kappa, per unit of assets that uh, firms have to pay and banks have to pay. And uh, these asset management services are, are goods, like uh, consumption goods, they, they cost uh, some price P. Um, and these are resource costs. So the asset management services require capital and labor. Um, and that means that um, what we wanna do in this economy is keep the balance sheets short. It's not essential that these are huge, uh, but uh, we wanna, so, so what, what is important is that you can't have uh, long balance sheets and there were large organizations that have a lot of assets for free, which I think is a, a sensible assumption. Mm -hmm. Okay, otherwise um, we're going to abstract from other sources of frictions, as I mentioned when talking about the literature. So this, this model is gonna have costless adjustment of equity in, in banks and firms. Um, and uh, the equilibrium size of banking is gonna be small relative to the capital stock. So it's not that kind of the last dollar of deposits as important to fund investment projects, that though there's enough uh, resources for that in the economy. The, the, this view of banking is really just banking uh, provides liquidity for um, the, the wheels to churn. Um, it is not important for capital accumulation. Um, and uh, then uh, the, the way for simplicity, we're going to say that households and banks and the central bank directly invest in capital, but that could easily be, be changed to have uh, bonds and stuff, because uh, there, there are a lot of equivalence position, um, propositions here, uh, as long as they don't involve liquid instruments, just because we're keeping, uh, we're just focusing on one friction, which is this liquidity provision. Okay, so... Um, how, does, uh, how can we characterize equilibrium in this model? Uh, well, there, we have a, a characterization result, which basically says uh, an equal, a competitive equilibrium of this model with these banks and firms and households um, is equivalent to a planner problem with a modified resource constraint where uh, this resource constraint uh, has uh, 
an extra cost attached to the, the three types of uh, entries in uh, national income accounting that the model has, consumption, investment, and output. And this comes with these different uh, buyers and sellers uh, need um, uh, resources in order to make transactions happen. So uh, people who want to consume, they need to carry deposits or arrange for credit lines, and then that, that's costly to produce. And then firms that make investment, they, they do similarly. And then sellers need to store funds and that is costly, uh, it requires costly to produce deposits and so forth. Um, and so, the, so the, uh, the equivalence result basically allows us to characterize in a very simple way uh, how, uh, how much does it cost for, for a, an allocation uh, of uh, consumption investment output uh, to be implemented. And uh, then uh, the real effects of a well-designed or a badly designed payment system uh, are, um, it can be read off of these costs. So a more costly payment system is basically one that has a less efficient production technology. And then we can, we can sort of look at the, how the allocation responds. It, it's like in a, in a neoclassical growth model where you have a technology shock, right? except here that, that it, it actually comes from the, the way the payment system is, is sort of run. Um, and so for example, you could have the effects differ by sector. If you uh, create a system in which it's particularly burdensome uh, for uh, firms to, um, for whom it's, um, it's more expensive to, to hold the long balance sheets. Uh, if you have a system where it's more expensive for them to uh, get liquidity, uh, for example, by making credit lines very expensive, then this uh, specifically discourages investment. Okay, so what I'll do now in the, in the remaining time, I'm going to uh, give you a flavor of uh, what these uh, these costs look like for different systems. That's what, kind of what the paper does. So we have this general result and then uh, we can take cases and think of what if there's only deposits, what if there's CBDC comes in, et cetera. And that all leads to kind of different uh, resource cost omega. And then the paper can go through those and compare and say, how does the, how the welfare uh, differ? Um, and so I will uh, show you uh, steady state welfare for different payment systems and summarize for simplicity, the predictability of the liquidity needs, which is this key parameter as we'll see by just one number, V. And I'm gonna show you sort of balance sheets and then uh, translate those into costs and, and provide interpretation. Okay, so let's begin with a world in which uh, banks offer only deposits. Um, in that world, um, how, does it, how does it have to uh, be um, the, the, the balance sheet? So we have uh, buyers, sellers, banks, and later we'll, we'll add a central bank. Um, and so before trade, the buyer's going to have to hold deposits and the bank's going to have to provide the deposits. And those are, uh, they have to be backed uh, by something that's, that's here, capital. And then the bank can issue some equity. And then comes the period where trade occurs. And so V of the buyers are going to get uh, a shock and they can uh, make a purchase. And uh, so V times D of the um, deposits are transferred from the buyer to the seller. And one minus V times D uh, remain with the buyer. Uh, so there's some guys that got unlucky so they can't consume. And so they have to hold the deposits uh, for another uh, half period uh, after trade. And um, the, uh, in the second period after trade, the, the bank's balance sheet remains the same because just this, what, what's happening is that there's just a swap of uh, um, who's like, uh, who's, uh, assets is the bank holding as liabilities, but that doesn't change the overall balance sheet of the bank. Okay, and so then uh, uh, because uh, it's costly to have these uh, deposits, people want to minimize, uh, we can kind of relate this uh, to, to the, from these liquidity constraints to uh, consumption and investment. Um, and uh, that's, that's sort of the calculation that we do in the paper in order to come up with the overall cost of the system. And so then there'll be an explicit formula for these, uh, these costs omega that I showed before. And I, I'm not, um, we're not gonna go through the gory detail of what this exactly looks like, but I, I'm just flashing this in order to show you that it's simple. And so if you look at the paper, that, that this is sort of something that is quite tractable, one can, one can interpret easily. Um, and so the message from this is that what, what is uh, banking with deposits? How does that work? Uh, well, it's a system where the liquidity costs are particularly high if the liquidity needs are unpredictable, okay? Um, and this is because uh, if, if it's unpredictable, I don't really know uh, whether I, I'm going to get the chance to go shopping, then I need to have all these precautionary holdings 
Um, and, but, that, but the chance that I uh, actually get to spend is low. And so that leads to large balance sheets relative to the transactions that we need to do. Okay? And so in, the, in such a world, uh, these deposits are particularly costly. Second point is that um, we have balance sheet costs here, not only for the intermediaries, but also for firms. And the way we think about this is that, so these firms that, um, that uh, produce capital and that need to uh, purchase uh, capital goods, we think of these as sort of asset managers, broadly speaking, kind of think of you know, capital is includes intangible. So then this is really about um, rebalancing portfolios. That also also something that takes liquidity. Um, and, and for those guys, uh, those are not kind of natural savers that want to put a lot of the balance sheet into deposits. Right? And so there, there's a cost there. And um, so then uh, if you have a lot of that going on, if you have a large uh, financial system that, that needs liquidity, then this, is, this deposit system, again, is uh, particularly costly. Good, so that's the deposit system. Um, so what if we allow credit lines, okay? Um, in an equilibrium where banks offer both deposits and credit lines, um, we can have all the balance sheets before trade blank. Right? What we have to do here is we want to have people arrange for liquidity um, that they need when they go shopping. Uh, and uh, that can now all be credit lines. And so initially this is off balance sheet. These are contingent liabilities. Uh, people can draw down the loan when they need it. And so not, no balance sheet cost before trade. Now, after trade, what's going to happen? So when, when people meet to trade, then um, the uh, buyers will uh, take out loans. So VL, uh, where L is the total uh, credit limit. So VL uh, of the, uh, where will be buyer loans taken out. And then the sellers, uh, they get VL. And this becomes a deposit at the bank. Okay? And so here you have this kind of creation of uh, inside money as the loans are uh, taken out. Um, and so then there are balance sheet costs there um, at, the, at the bank, because now the, the bank has a balance sheet that's got the loans on the left-hand side and the, and the deposit on the right-hand side. Uh, but what's nice about it is that uh, you sort of have this, there's a little, uh, the buyers, uh, um, that, that sort of balance sheet costs that the buyer causes because of his liquidity that he needs and what the seller causes are, are the same because they, they match each other. That's where this complementarity shows. And then, so we can calculate again, uh, how does that translate into, um, into costs? And uh, the punchline without looking at the formula detail is that uh, the costs are lower. Um, and so where do the welfare gains from credit lines come from in this world? Well, it's basically you avoid all these precautionary holdings um, though, that we, we talked about before with deposits, because now with credit lines, you have a contingent liability. It's kind of well tailored to having this unpredictable liquidity needs. And that effectively works like a higher TFP uh, in the model. And it is particularly valuable uh, from what we we're saying before for uh, firms or asset managers uh, who don't like to hold uh, liquid assets. Um, and so that, that's going to work like in a model investment specific technical progress. Okay? So it's going to favor uh, capital accumulation. Um, <coughs> and it comes from this complementarity um, that, the, uh, that the banks have. It's basically that, so you save the safe balance sheet length, safe, safe collateral. Okay, so. Um, now we're ready. Uh, so, so what I've done so far, I've, I've, I've uh, given you this world where there is unpredictable liquidity needs. And then deposits uh, is a costly way to, do, to handle that because um, you get all these precautionary holdings. Credit lines is kind of a cool way to do it because you get these contingent uh, instruments. And now what happens when we uh, add uh, a deposits only intermediary um, that competes with the commercial banks? That's the thing. So this new intermediary um, is going to have uh, some so the parameters are going to be that their maximum leverage ratio and their asset management costs. So those are, those are also present. And uh, the leading example, and that's the language I'm going to use, uh, is, uh, is, is a CBDC, uh, where the central bank offers the deposits at a marginal cost. Okay? Um, and so, so also the central bank has some asset management costs. It's better uh, if the balance sheet is shorter. So we could interpret that as being partly political costs, et cetera. Um, 
And so, so then the question is, you know, uh, is, it, is it good when it enters or not? Okay, so a couple of uh, sort of simple points uh, right away. Well, it's gonna be good only if the new technology is better in the sense that this kind of ratio of uh, the asset management cost to the leverage is lower than for the commercial banks. Okay, so that could be, so it, it's gotta be the case that that the central bank either is better at asset management or has a better ability to commit so that it, it can lever more. Okay. Um, now, second point, uh, if this is the case and uh, we're in a we start with a deposit only system, so the, uh, the banks uh, do not offer credit lines, then it's always better to, I mean, now, now you can sort of do the deposit provision better, that, that's always great in this model. There's no other, other uh, counter force. So what would happen? Well, all the depositors would migrate to the central bank, uh, commercial banks are gone. Um, because we have assumed that uh, here the commercial banks add no value beyond liquidity provision, once you've got the central bank take care of that, it's not important um, to have the commercial banks anymore. Um, it's not going to hurt investment, for example. In fact, investment is going to be higher because the liquidity is now cheaper, so the asset managers can rebalance portfolios faster, select projects, etc. Um, so that's the sort of liquidity-centric view says that in, if you replace a um, deposit system with a better one, then it's good. Now, so the interesting question is, what if uh, we start with a system as we have it now, where there's both deposits and, and credit lines that are complementary? Um, and uh, now comes the entry of the CBDC. All right, so, um, so now we got it. So, so far, a lot of the kind of the choice of payment instruments was uh, simple. Now we got to think about, um, so people can actually pick what they want. Okay, so, um, and, and there, so we, we go through uh, different cases in the paper. You could imagine uh, that, uh, now that there's a kind of a cheaper CBDC comes in, people uh, stop using credit lines or some people stop using credit lines, et cetera. So there's a couple of cases. Um, I'm gonna focus here on the case where uh, buyers still continue to use credit lines uh, in the case when the CBDC enters and the paper does, does the other case. Um, and so then we can think about uh, what is the response of the commercial banks to the entry of the CBDC. Uh, well, um, it's still uh, useful for uh, commercial banks when they make loans because of uh, the, the credit lines get drawn down uh, to issue deposits. But now because it's competition, they're gonna have to match the higher interest rate that uh, people can earn on the CBDC. Um, and then what they can do uh, in order to not make losses is to increase the price of the credit line. Uh, this, uh, this means that uh, then for the buyers, uh, this is now more expensive. Okay? So they see that so they, there's this, uh, the sellers uh, uh, need get deposits at the bank, but that's gotta be priced uh, better for them, but then it is bad for the buyers because now the credit line is more expensive. Um, uh, the second thing is that uh, because the funding costs are uh, larger now for the banks, it's no longer profitable for them to invest in capital. So they'll actually just focus on uh, credit line loans only. Okay, so if we look at the, the asset positions, what's gonna happen is that um, the, the credit lines are gonna be used. So, so the after trade kind of looks very, if you looked at it down there before uh, first, uh, it, it looks uh, similar to before, except that a bunch of people migrate uh, to the central bank because the central bank um, no longer wants to uh, hold capital. And then the second uh, point is that the, um, uh, the, uh, the bank, because it, it anticipates that some money will flow out in the after trade period, has to hold some liquidity up front in order to um, take care of that later. And that's where then there'll be some balance sheet costs in addition in the before trade period. So um, how does that then translate into uh, uh, costs? So the, the main result uh, of the paper is that uh, when you compare the resource constraints for this case, we have that the CBDC entry improves welfare if and only if this equation holds, which says economically that uh, the, uh, if the CBDC is sufficiently cheap 
uh, to uh, offset the cost of the carrier line, then it's good. Then it works like higher TFP. But if uh, the cost at which the central bank can offer things is only marginally below what the private sector can do, then CBDC actually uh, reduces welfare. And this is because of this effect on the, on the credit line. Okay. So the, the competition for deposits is going to distort the price of the credit line. Um, and, uh, and that makes the overall provision of uh, liquidity in general equilibrium worse. Uh, now, uh, I, I spoke uh, the whole time in terms of CBDC entering, and I said this is when the, the government uh, prices things at the marginal cost. This means that the argument extends directly to any uh, intermediary that provides deposits only, and there's marginal cost pricing. So if you had a money market fund with some technology or a Libra or something, uh, that if, if that's price at marginal cost, and if then, then the point here is that even if we have a superior technology to provide deposits because of the complementarity and thereby the externality, uh, that can reduce welfare overall. So the punchline, beware of these kind of hybrid payment systems. There is a force here that, that uh, might reduce welfare. Okay, so that is uh, uh, what I have. So again, uh, the angle that we propose uh, to look at in, in, we propose to look at here is uh, we want to think about the market for liquidity includes credit lines and bank deposits, and uh, because of the lack of complementarity, CBDC then is only going to be uh, beneficial if it's much cheaper, not if it's uh, slightly cheaper. And the same applies to uh, other deposits only intermediate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, we have a uh, very um, active Q and A uh, session with many questions that came up. Um, so, um, and I'm going to go right into it. But I, I just have one very brief question uh, for you. And so, this has to do with speed, right? So, as I understand it, in your model, you you have to take a deposit, and so you have to move money into the deposit, right? And so, this is like a stationary thing, if you want. Now, imagine a world in which you have a credit line in which you can move very quickly from your commercial bank account into the CBDC and then use that as a means of payment. Now, there is a question of whether or not. So this essentially means like you can draw down your, like you, like you go to an ATM and withdraw cash, right? And, and use that for payments. Is, is that have any effect? Is there a particular friction that you assume that is not uh, visible? Okay, so, I mean, here, so so it is, uh, yeah, so I, I, I went uh, quickly through the part where we have both uh, competing. Um, what happens is that uh, people can migrate. Um, and what that does is then it means that the commercial bank has to hold additional liquidity buffers uh, in order to uh, prevent well, or in order to handle payment instructions where people go quickly from the uh, commercial bank to the central bank. Okay? And that contributes to the cost. It is not an essential part. So we have like versions with and without this feature, but that, that so that is allowed in the, in the general model and it, is, uh, it, it can um, lead to additional costs. Okay. So uh, I think I want to go now to the Q&A, and I'm, I think I'm going to go uh, in order of the, how they arrived. Now, um, Angelica, you asked me that you also wanted to have one of your uh, collaborators be able to answer some of the questions. Um, and for that, who would you like me to promote to uh, panelist status? Is it uh, Joanna um, or um, who, who else? Um, I think we haven't really discussed that. Um... Joanna of the Miko, can just one of you type in the, the Q&A box who wants to do it? <laughs> Both equally qualified. So nobody says anything. So for now, you well, have I'm to you, gonna, you're on your own. And get it then I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to, I think I'm going to um, refer to uh, Joanna and that's the Miko. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, I so, that. All right. Okay. So, um, so let's, let's go first through the questions. Uh, we have a question uh, from Tom Mai Chakabati. Um, why do you think is the per dollar net pecuniary cost higher for Canada than for the US? Um, so thanks for the question. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, however, I think we should keep in mind that 
so the paper wasn't written um, with the intention of the plan to um, do a cross co uh, country comparison. So what we were looking at is to compare the patterns in terms of the regressive effects that uh, show up in both countries. And you can see that those are uh, really uh, quite similar. Um, in terms of like in the, uh, um, the uh, lower income cohort pays more per dollar than the higher income cohort. Um, so now, um, so why it's different? So one thing is that um, we did use slightly different data sources for the two countries. So I think at this point, I um, can't exclude that this might be uh, partially driven by that. So the, uh, the regressive effects are, are very robust to that, um, but there, we had to make some assumptions for each country that could might as well uh, drive some of that. Then on the other hand, you do need to realize that um, the um, structure of the banking sector and also the structure of the retail sector and also you know, the demographic uh, makeup is different in both countries. And that could, could drive some of uh, the, uh, the differences. However, we haven't uh, really uh, investigated that. So at this point, um, I think it remains to be seen whether it's driven by uh, some of the data and modeling choices, um, probably more driven by data than by the model. Um, and then I think the secondary question is like, how much is this related to uh, some features of the, the banking sector and the demographic makeup and the banking choices that consumers make in, in each country? Can I add to that? Uh, I just want to- Joanna has a- I just have a simple answer is the banking fees tend to on average be much higher in Canada than they are in the US and the rewards are lower. So the Canadian consumers seem to be hit on both ends. <laughs> Ouch. Um, well, on that note, maybe um, I'm going to go next to Hannah's question, um, who asks, uh, would the surcharge for credit card use alleviate the inequality? And on that, maybe you also want to answer the question of what rules are there around uh, surcharges? So, again, I can speak to Canada, and then I think Joanna can uh, take the question, can uh, explain what's going on in the US. So... Currently in Canada, I think things are, um, uh, so at the time when the data was collected, um, which was um, uh, in like the range from 2015 to 2017, uh, definitely there weren't uh, any surcharges. Um, I would say that actually in terms of like how that would mitigate the distributional effect, the same caveat uh, applies to it that I raised with the, uh, you know, um, modifications to the other fees, like the rewards and the interchange fees and uh, and the banking fees that, and like the first pass and first order, it might look like it could mitigate some of that. But I think what we showed is that there is this pass through, right? So that this might as well have unintended consequences. So um, I think right now without like really a very careful analysis of all the, uh, and um, looking at all the um, the uh, um, interconnectedness and the network effects in the two-sided payment system, it's not clear whether having surcharges would make it more level, more fair, or less regressive. Because the uh, they said, for example, um, there might be changes to card acceptance. There may be changes to issuance in the, in in that. Um, therefore. Um, I think the, the answer is uh, more complicated than just saying yes or no. Um, it has been discussed, I, I know that, to allow surcharges um, or to allow price discrimination um, based on payment methods. In Canada, we have some of that, so merchants are allowed to offer discounts for payment methods that they prefer, but we don't see it happen very often. Um, so from that I, I would say that we wouldn't even know if there'd be an uptake of the uh, ability to uh, price discriminate differently. I have a paper on payment steering and in that I actually show that, especially with the discounts, uh, the drawback is that you need to offer the, at least with the current Canadian rules, you need to offer the discount to everyone. So if somebody walks into your store and their intention was to pay with cash, you can't price discriminate that from someone who wanted to use their credit card and you want to steer them to use cash. So the discount has to go to everyone and that would then, 
you know, re effectively really reduce the price for the merchant for everyone, um, which is similar to, uh, you know, the pass-through scenario. But I think there are just lots of factors and lots of subsequent effects that have to be taken into account to give a clear answer of whether uh, surcharges would, um, you know, level the, um, take away the regressive effect. And I think Joanna can speak to uh, the surcharge. Yeah, so in the US, uh, surcharges are allowed, but they're extremely rare, except for gasoline stations, which I'm sure everybody is aware that, you know, they often have price differences between cash and credit cards. Uh, I think there's a variety of reasons. They're very hard to administer. They're hard to enforce. I think with businesses are worried about losing customers. Um, they also don't know, merchants don't know, we've actually interviewed merchants for different projects in the past. They don't know if you pull out a credit card from your wallet, they have no idea how much it's gonna cost them to accept it, even after they swipe it. So different credit cards carry different rewards. Um, so I think it's just a complex way to administer the fees. I'm, in principle, I'm in favor of price differentiation, but it's just hard to administer in this case and, and very rare. And let me add uh, that in Canada, the uh, no surcharge rule is uh, is effective. So uh, as of now, like usually when the merchant chooses to accept a credit card payment, the credit card networks uh, impose a no surcharge rule so that they effectively actually can't do that to be in compliance with their um, payment processor agreement. So um, I have a, there, there's a lot of questions also actually all directed at Angelica's work, but I also want to like to direct some questions at, at Martin. Um, so there's a question by uh, David Allen, which says, to the extent that CBDCs offer any net transactional cost savings, and since the central bank is a liquidity backstop for the banking sector, whose costs of providing that liquidity should reflect that efficiency, oh, that's long, wouldn't that mean that CBDCs would always result in a net systemic benefit? Martin. Yeah, so thanks, that, that's, that's an interesting question. So uh, the way that I would think about that in the model is that, uh, so, so what is a crisis? That could be a period in which the commercial banks cost or cost relative to the, the leverage that they can have, that their constraints tighten. So then the, the effective cost of providing liquidity from the uh, private sector goes up. And then uh, this, uh, the, the liquidity backstop uh, story kind of would kind of show up as then mm -hmm. when, when this gap between the two costs, private and public is larger, then, then yes, uh, the model would say uh, CBDC is, is kind of better in this. Uh, now the model does say there will always be uh, this distortionary effect on credit lines that will come uh, if you get rid of the complementarity. And so, so one sort of interesting question that uh, I think we should answer but have not done is then how are you going to price uh, the uh, CBDC in this, uh, it, at this point? Okay, so suppose that there is a crisis and then uh, now comes the, uh, um, sorry, you know, the rates on... Uh, so liquidity provision becomes more expensive uh, generally uh, if, from the private sector. Now the government can set uh, the rate to respond. Should it just leave it the same or should it also respond to uh, get the distortion? What's sort of the optimal policy there uh, to, to respond? That, that I think is an interesting question that uh, they would figure out. Um. Now, I, I got a question which um, goes back to your comments about Libra or DM. Um, and I'm wondering, is it is so? To what extent is it actually uh, the the problem here that say these networks are explicitly just for payments, right? So if, for instance, you would have a situation where DM would also uh, allow what they promise to be like a new financial infrastructure, where they also have credit, would that change any of the implications that you have? So that you literally have two competing payment systems uh, running alongside one another, both with actually provision of credit. Yeah, and, okay, so, and with that is the question. So let me just add one thing. So is the problem here really that, that you just lock up essentially deposits in some form when you, when you run a stable coin system like DM? Yeah, exactly. Right. So, yeah, so, the, so the, the basic cost comes because you're, you're running the payment system with longer balance sheets. If you lock up the deposits backed by some 
a bunch of assets that's not itself involved in liquidity provision. All right. So if it was a credit card uh, loan, even it may be, um, so, so if, if there's liquidity provision on the asset side as well, then that's good. Uh, and if, so if the, there's a new infrastructure with that and that is uh, cheaper, that's great. Um, but if it's uh, just taking a portfolio uh, to back deposits, then that uh, is only great if it's much better. That, that's the argument. Okay. Um, so I, I want to be mindful of times. So we have the session is scheduled for another seven minutes. Um, so um, now uh, I want to ask a few more questions. Angelica, maybe you can try to be very brief in terms of the answer that you can provide here. Uh, so I have a question from Naomi D. And she asked, you distinguish between credit card, credit cash and debit cards at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, does the rest of your model work equally well for these three forms of payment? Or do you think it would be interesting to distinguish between them because they have different characteristics? Um, yeah, the model works equally well for all of them. Um, and just keep in mind, we're using um, directly observed behavior. So we don't need to model the uh, the payment choice of the, the preferences because the, the payment choice is revealed to us. So. Um, all right. Um, so then uh, there is a follow-up question. I'm just trying to find it, um, which, which uh, would go on this and this, what is it? Um, so this is by Miriam Ibrahim. Um, I'm wondering about the alignment of the forms of payment to socioeconomic status. Is there a correlation of wealth to credit and poverty to cash payments? Um, so we have a correlation between income. So yes. So uh, people with higher income use have and use credit cards more intensively than lower income. I mean, that that is one reason why you get this regressive effect. Okay, and now, I mean, there's a question here from um, Andrew. I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry. Um, talking about the cost of intermediaries in the payment system um, in your model, Martin. Um, do you have any view on that? Or even outside of your model, maybe? Yeah, so there was a question which related to the cost of intermediaries. So uh, generally speaking, whether or not intermediaries create frictions. In your particular case, I think they oh, okay. are really a service provider with, you know, providing lines of credit. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, the, the, the principle that we put in the model is that there is a per um, dollar of asset cost of managing assets. And uh, so, so that uh, you know, if, if there's always uh, agency problems and um, the larger is the balance sheet, um, then, then that scales, but that's the assumption. And we do not put a number on it. Um, that can be, uh, I mean, basically this would show up in, um, in spreads on, and, or in, and in equity prices. So, so one could develop an empirical strategy to figure it out and so people have, uh, quantified what sort of frictional costs in intermediation are. Uh, here, uh, it is done very simply just to get the theoretical point across. But, but so yeah, I mean, in order to sort of quantitatively evaluate this, then, then one would want to look at um, spreads and, uh, and uh, stock returns on, of uh, intermediaries in order to uh, figure this out. So, um... Alessa uh, Gorelova asked a clarifying question, which is CBDC, CBDC rates being higher would result in commercial banks charging higher fees on credit lines as the deposit funding base would be diminished. So that's, I think, the question. What do you think would then be the optimal, um, op I think it's optimal, optimal rate on CBDCs that would ensure sufficient consumer take up, but not hinder commercial bank funding? Yeah, great question. So, yeah, so um, what all we have done so far is we have said, suppose it's priced at marginal cost, then uh, is, is welfare reducing mm -hmm. under the condition that I show. That, uh, a great follow-up question, as you're saying, is, is now, can the government make uh, price the uh, CBDC a bit worse for the deposit customers in order to... Uh, fix or in order to take it into account the externality. Um, I can speak to the case where there, uh, there are no leverage constraints. In that case, you cannot improve 
In that case, basically, uh, the, only, the best thing is to not have the CBDC at all. I have not yet characterized the case, the immediate case where there is some leverage constraints. So there may be uh, sort of the Ramsey problem where you ask what's the optimal rate on CBDC would allow some sort of smooth trade-off. Um, that, that is something to, to be determined. But, but it's so, and, and I mean, more generally, I mean, this model is also kind of, I mean, why, why is this so stark in the case of the, um, uh, when there's no leverage constraint, it's, it's, it's all kind of bang, bang, because the, it's, it's the radical model where there's no sort of switching costs and smooth uh, trade-offs between things. If you had those, presumably you, you'd, you'd sort of get some interior thing where there's some optimal rate, but it, it's probably going to be um, the optimal deposit rate um, is going to price things above marginal cost. Okay, um, I want to ask one last question so that we're not running over time because, you know, you know, our events team doesn't like me running over time. <laughs> um, and so this is a question by David Allen, uh, which asks, the analysis of the impact on retail prices of credit card payments seems to ignore the impact of high inventory turn rates, which lowering merchants' inventory finance costs and hence improving profitability. That is also reflected in part in a reduction in prices. Of course, debit card use would theoretically do the same without the regressive externalities. But even so, it seems that would at least reduce the aggressive impact of credit cards to some extent. Was this effect considered? Sorry, this is a long question. <laughs> well, it has a short answer. And the short answer is like, no, <laughs> this effect was not considered. Um, and as you point out, I I think you maybe are you alluding to some sort of cash and advance constraint? I'm actually not kind of quite clear how it would reduce the inventory cost. So I I think I would have to think more more about how that that works. And as I said, in our model, we um when we uh, look at these uh, um, scenarios, we keep the payment behavior um, as observed. So this is an interesting question. I think I would just need to think a bit more about how uh, how that is related. We don't have a full model here of the how the merchant uh, manages their other business line besides payments, right? So. Okay. Uh, so sorry. Um, I have one raised hand. Maybe we're gonna uh, take one live question, and then. Um, so this is a question by uh, Xavier. Um, Daniel, I'm. I don't have the power to um, unmute somebody. Maybe you can do that quickly. There you go. Xavier, you can go ahead and talk. Excited silence. Okay. I uh, lowered his hand. Okay, good. Well, then that's that's that I would say is then it. So we have scheduled it until 12.15. I don't want to run over time. Um, and be mindful of time. Uh, I would, I'm about to close the session. The last thing I want to say is the next event that we're scheduling from the CIBA forum, which is not uh, co-organized by Rotman, um, is organized by Gu Habermann. It's going to take place two weeks from now. If you're interested in this particular event, please go to our website, which is the C cyber or CBR forum, uh, cbr-forum.org, and you can find information about the event and register there. Uh, the video for this presentation will be provided for a limited amount of time on that website too. Uh, with that, I, I want to thank Martin and Angelica for great uh, presentations and really useful insights um, on very different aspects of um, you know, the payment system and also what, what the introduction of a CBDC would do to our banking system and costs in the banking system. Um, and uh, with that, I'll close the session. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, Martin. Great. Thanks. Good to see you. It's great to have you.